This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week Windows 11 got launched and I think it might make the Microsoft Store great for the first time ever. Brave, the browser company, made a brand new search engine and we finally got some official news about the Galaxy Z Fold 3. Our quiz this week requires you to guess phones by just looking at some partial photos of them, see if you can recognize all 20 models, links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with Samsung going all in on the price wars by launching the Galaxy M32 with a super bright 90Hz Full HD AMOLED screen, a huge 6000 mAh battery and a Helio G80 chip for the equivalent of just 200 bucks. Pretty insane. Then we have Sony finally making its flagship Xperia 1 Mark III available for pre-orders just two and a half months after it was released, which believe it or not is really fast for Sony. So congrats. And finally, India's telecom giant Reliance teased the ultra affordable Geophone Next that among other things looks like the first phone to have Snapchat filters built prominently right into the camera app. Probably because as I have just discovered, India is apparently Snapchat's second largest market by far. To stay informed with all of the new gadget announcements and their details from the week, visit the Crowd app and upload your favorites so I know what to feature next week. Okay, and my first story of the week will be Microsoft announcing Windows 11. And I went into this event not expecting it to be a big deal, but Microsoft really surprised me. So on the surface, pun very much intended, the updates were pretty much as expected. Nice, but not exactly groundbreaking. There's a fresh coat of paint, a new start menu, new system sounds and themes, a bunch of old inbox apps are finally getting a facelift, including Notepad, Paint and the Settings app, and you have probably seen most of that that by now. I know some people really love the new look, others really hate it, I personally think Windows needed a facelift and I think it looks pretty nice. And on the usability front, it's a similar picture as well. Window management has been improved, so you can arrange windows in triple columns and other cool layouts, which the OS will actually remember with new snap groups. Windows will also hand off and remember your layouts better for external monitors, etc. Plus the touch interactions have apparently also been improved. There's a better touch keyboard that looks pretty much like Microsoft SwiftKey, easier window resizing with touch, etc. Again, all small but overall nice updates in my opinion. They also vaguely mentioned improvements to speed and battery life and apparently Windows updates will install faster and will be smaller in size, which is cool I guess, but since the company hasn't actually revealed any performance metrics, we'll just talk about those later. So that's all nice, I guess, but what I was the most surprised by was the company's new approach to the Microsoft Store. There is a new design for the store, of course, that is prettier and supposedly also faster, but the real big update is what happened under the hood. See, the Microsoft Store in Windows 10 was originally conceived to be very much like a mobile app store, which means it had two major restrictions. First, developers could only submit Windows 10 apps built specifically for the store. And second, like on mobile app stores, Microsoft handled all of the transactions and took a 30% cut from them. Now, over time, Microsoft has gradually opened up the store as a sort of admission of failure, but with Windows 11, they're basically kicking in the door, they're tearing down a bunch of walls and they're throwing all of that right into the trash. First, the new store allows developers to publish pretty much any Windows app to it, regardless of what technologies it uses, plus progressive web apps, and now even Android apps can be listed in the store too, in a partnership with the Amazon App Store. This means not every Android app will be present, as anything that relies on Google services will likely not work. But second, and maybe even more importantly, Microsoft has also made it optional for developers to use their commerce tools. This means that paying the 30 or by now 15% cut is optional and developers like Adobe who have previously avoided the store like the plague because they had complex subscription bundles and a gigantic hodgepodge of Win32, UWP and even web apps, well, they can now just list all of them in the Microsoft store and charge the users however and whatever they want. 
Adobe is supposedly bringing their whole gigantic creative cloud suite to the Microsoft Store. It looks like Microsoft is also finally bringing their entire Office suite there too, which was embarrassingly missing until now. And I can't imagine any developer not wanting to do the same in the near future too. I mean, there are basically no downsides that I can think of now. And with the Microsoft Store now opened up, it could just become like a central, convenient place to find all of the programs that you want, regardless of what type of programs they are, and for you to just download it from there instead of having to go to a random website and find a random exe file and just download it from a random server, which sounds significantly better and more polished. Okay, and my second story of the week will be Brave, the privacy-focused browser maker, launching their own search engine, which also turned out to be a significantly bigger deal than I thought. You can try it out for yourself by just going to search.brave.com. The service is currently in beta, but it is supposedly going to ship as the default search engine in the Brave browser later this year, and in my short time with it, it seemed okay. There is a dark mode, yay. There are a few of these smart cards, like for the weather or a calculator or stock picks, although not quite as many as there are on Google, for example. And at least the simple searches that I tried seemed to work well enough. Of course, as you would expect from a company like Brave, the main focus of this search engine is on things like privacy, with the company saying that it won't track its users. There is apparently going to be either a free ad-supported version or a paid ad-free version, which would be an interesting change for sure, and maybe most important of all, Brave says that they are actually using their own index in search for the vast majority of results. Now, I have a full video somewhere here about indexing and about how these alternative search engines like DuckDuckGo and Ecosia and Startpage basically don't actually search the web themselves. Instead, they buy anonymous search results from Google or from Bing, for example, and they present those as their own. But Brave doesn't want to do that. They actually want to do the searching and the heavy lifting themselves. Now, the reason why the others all rely on Google and Bing to do that heavy lifting is because it's almost impossibly hard to catch up with either at this point. So we'll have to wait and see whether Brave can actually do a good job at it. But it's certainly cool that they are at least trying. And if you scroll through the first page of search results and you didn't find what you were looking for, they just let you go straight to a competitor. Interesting concept. With DuckDuckGo and other alternative search engines continuing their slow but steady rise, it is pretty clear that there is at least a significant niche of users that actually wants an alternative search engine. So welcome to the party, Brave. Okay, and my last story for the week will be a super quick one, and it is official confirmation in the form of an FCC filing that the Galaxy Z Fold 3 will indeed have an S Pen. That means Samsung must have found a way to make the inner screen hard and scratch resistant enough to allow for a sharp object to repeatedly press against it, which is one of the last things that kept me feeling uneasy about switching to a foldable. I think pens on big screens make a ton of sense, so I can't wait to see this in action. Now, big screen, small screen, doesn't matter which screen, the best thing you can do on either is watch really high quality videos over on our streaming service, Nebula. It's a beautiful platform built and owned by some of YouTube's smartest creators, including MKBHD, Real Engineering, Strange Parts, Polymatter, and of course me. Nebula is a true home for our content, where we publish everything ad-free and without tracking or fear of demonetization or strange algorithmic mishaps. My tech out there videos usually even go up there a day or two early, and Nebula has a ton of great originals too, like multiple long-form documentaries from Wendover Productions, a fantastic series on storytelling in games by Lessons of the Screenplay, and many, many more. Best of all, you can get access to all of Nebula for free with a subscription to my sponsor, CuriosityStream, which itself is less than 15 bucks for an entire year. That's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is, of course, the premier place on the internet for high-quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you are stuck at home. I have recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there is a ton of other great content from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.